first time it happened was an accident. That's usually how superpowers work, if you could call it that. No one gets bit by a radioactive spider and immediately decides to hop to it and join the Avengers. It takes a bit more time than that. A bit more confusion and hijinks and comedic relief. In my case, it took my dad throwing up his guts and sobbing into my seven-year-old shoulder. Like every superhero, I have a dead parent. You need at least one. Two really gets you up the ranks, Batman style, but one will suffice. Mom died when I was six. Cancer. Classic hospital tubes, bleach and disinfectant and the whole nine yards. She passed in comfort, or at least that's what I tell myself. One hand in dad's, the other sandwiched between mine and my sister, Anya's. I remember it, you know. I don't know if Anya does. I sure hope not. In another classic superhero trope, dad deteriorated, fast. A drink or two at dinner turned into seven by Anya's bedtime, and I developed a routine as I approached seven. Make sure Anya is fed, gets her in her PJs, kiss her goodnight, bring dad the sand bucket he kept in the garage, the one we used to bring to the beach, tuck it beside the couch, cover him with the blanket, press your ear to his lips and find his breath. Go to bed. Mind you, Dad was never violent, or angry, or even mean, just sad. Like a glass too full, eyes always brimming and on the verge of tears. His lips were always chapped to the point of bleeding. Sometimes he would kiss my forehead on those drunken nights when I sat on his lap on the couch. And I would take the back of my hand and wipe his livid blood from my face. And one night, it was worse than normal. The vomiting had started early, with acidic bile sizzling in his throat and spewing through his lips, as I held the sand bucket below his chin in vain. Warm tears dripped onto my fingers as he bellowed in my ear, and I did the only thing I could think of. What made Anya feel better when she cried? A gentle hand on his shoulder. And with his pulse, I felt pain. Not physical, but pain. Carving mom's name into my young heart, and knocking the wind out my lungs as memories ping-ponged back and forth against my skull. Mom, on their wedding day, brown locks pulled into a messy bun, gazing up in admiration as she smiles. Anya as a baby, wrapped in Mom's arms, with me smashing my fists against a toy keyboard in my father's lap. Mom getting tired going up the stairs. Mom crying and sweeping clumps of her hair onto the counter with every swipe of the brush. Mom in the hospital, and mom dead, dying over and over again in front of my eyes as I closed my eyes to no avail. Over and over and over, I felt despair, messy, harrowed despair. And I opened my eyes and saw dad, tears tried, staring curiously at me. While my heart was weighed down with anchors, he looked as if he could take a deep breath for the first time in ages. He smiled. Booze staining his teeth and curdling his breath, but smiling all the same. That's how I figured out I'm an emotional conduit. And like a leech, Dad sucked my power dry, day after day, till he became addicted to the bliss that let him breathe, even temporarily. It almost killed him, you know, but that's another story for another day. I feel bad blocking his number, I really do, but I need to move on and so does he. My shrink says it's a way to set boundaries and reduce codependency. Thank God for the counselling centre at my university. Because after years and years of taking pain, it's nice to dish it out once a week on Dr. Kressler's comfy couch, equipped with Play-Doh and stress balls. Anya's buttery voice swarms me as I merge into the highway, tucking my phone between my chin and my shoulder as I adjust my mirror. When are you getting here? It's getting late. And I got us reservations for brunch at 11, at that real fancy place, you know, with the good tater tots and the really bougie omelettes. I sigh as I flick on my blinker and move to the left lane, car picking up speed as I begin to cross a lengthy bridge. Working on it, shouldn't be more than 45 minutes. I've missed Anya, and jumped on the chance to visit her at college this weekend, now that I was done with my midterms and she had some downtime. Anya had just started her freshman year, 
but was already flooded her schedule with extracurriculars and organisations. I envy her sometimes for having a brain with only one set of feelings and memories. Must save up a lot of space. Okay, she responds. Remember, my dorm is room 115. I'll have a whiteboard and... Hold that thought, I murmur, as something catches my attention in my rearview mirror. It's a figure, head in their hands, teetering back and forth over the edge of the bridge. Ah, hell. Anya, I'll call you back. What's up? Is everything... Click. My car shudders as I pull off to the side of the road, and a tingle races up my spine as I put the car into park. Amy Winehouse is abruptly silenced as the car settles, and I reach to unlock the door. The cold nips at my fingertips as I shove them into my back pockets and make my way towards the man on the bridge. Already beginning to shake from the cold. Goosebumps prick the back of my neck as my breath billows in front of my face with every exhale. Finally, I reach him, albeit a safe distance away. Hi, I say. What else do you do? He flinches, then looks at me. He looks almost my same age, tall, sandy brown hair curling around his temples and grazing his freckled face. His eyes are very green. His hands are clenched in fists as he turns away from me and stares out in the open water. Fuck off, he says. I will, I respond, but I'm awfully curious about why you're standing on that ledge. Awfully curious? Jesus, Sasha. You sound like a loyalist from the 1800s. You really want to know, he snores. Or do you just want to keep me from throwing myself off the ledge? Well, both, I guess. But if you really want to, how about you throw yourself off that bridge after we talk about it? Do a somersault or something. I'll hold up one of those scorecards, like they do on TV. The man cracks a smile. You're sick. I take this as a sign to get closer. I take a few steps forward, gauging his reaction. When he doesn't flinch, I move closer until I'm merely a few feet away. I'm not the one teetering on the edge of a bridge. I think you win in the sickness department. Fair, he responds. I just don't think I can do this anymore. I really fucked up. Like, fucked up everything. Fucked up the one good thing I've ever had in my life. There's nothing left for me. Not anymore. At this point, we're standing next to each other, overlooking the horizon. The wind flips my braid over my shoulder. I look at him and notice a fresh bruise blossoming around his eye. Tears form in their corners. I sense a car speeding behind us, but it doesn't stop. I'm used to dealing with feelings with my hands, not my brain. I falter. That sucks. The man laughs, the noise cutting across the cold and over the ledge. Yeah, it really fucking does. Silence. Well, gave talking a try, and that didn't do shit. This is going to sound weird, I say, but I can help you. The man laughs again. Really? Because so far, your crisis intervention skills suck. I shake my head. No talk. Give me your hand. He looks at me, green eyes filled with skepticism. You serious? Humor me. You're about to jump off a bridge anyways. What's one more stupid choice? With that, the man shrugs and slipped his hand into mine. And I feel... Pride. A flood of pride overtakes me as I step backwards, gripping the man's hand like a lifeline. There's a woman in front of me, hair fire red and eyes copper brown, sobbing on a ragged sofa. Her knees are bruised and her face is wet with tears, sweat soaking her hairline. My heart billows with joy and lust as I watch her. My laughter, male and strong, reverberates through the cellar as I watch her squirm and plead love. It floods every crevice of my body as I take a red lock and twist it between my fingers. Anger. The girl will not stop crying. I thrust her a bottle of water, command her to drink, but she doesn't, pushing me away with shaky hands. You need to drink. My voice is familiar. I reach towards her to give her a hug and she flinches away, burying her head in her hands. Please let me go, please. Fear. The girl looks sick and pale. Her copper eyes are glazed over as she shakes in the corner, head whipping back and forth before she catches my eyes, silently pleading. 
Her hair is less shiny as it was before. I command her to eat. Just kill me already. Anger again, as I feel her shoulders under my hands. Eat, damn it. Anger as I pull her up by her hair. Anger as I retrieve the switchblade from my pocket and point it at her throat. Guttural threats spilling from my lips. Anger as she doesn't react. Do it. Something sick and unnameable as I swipe the blade across her throat and her body hits the ground with a thick thud. Something desperate as she gurgles and clumsily thrashes her limbs back and forth before falling still. Blood bumping from her neck quick, then slow, then not at all. Dripping at a snail's pace. Sadness. Deep, immovable sadness as I drop to my knees and sob. Remorse and regret. A heaviness in my heart that I had only felt once before. When I was seven and touched my father's shoulder. I'm devastated. And then my eyes open. The man stares at me with a perplexed expression on his face. Tears pour down my face as I lock my hands on my scalp and pull on my hair, willing the basket of feelings out of my body. He watches me as I pant. The man finds his voice. What did you do? What did you do? I take a couple of breaths as I choke down a sob. I, I took your feelings. They're mine now. I'm going home now. He grabs my wrist. Wait, how? I feel... Nothing. I feel incredible. I don't want to talk about it. The man slings his shoulder around me and pulls me into his chest, grinning. That was amazing. You're amazing. Thank you. I need to get off this bridge. I'm okay now. I try to wrestle myself from his grip, but to no avail. I'm having trouble catching my breath and try to will my way out of an impending panic attack. I'm Casey, he says. What's your name? Sasha, I wince, already regretting not making up an alias. Sasha, he pulls away from me and grasps me by the shoulders, holding me up as I command myself to take deep breaths. Thank you. Are you okay? I nod brashly. Fine. I'm going to go now. You look like you're about to pass out. I don't think you should drive. Want me to drive you home? I can call a tow for your car. No, it's fine. Please, Casey responds, steering me off the bridge. You can trust me. It's safe to say we've gotten to know each other pretty well by now. Finally, I wrench away from his grip. I'm going to visit my sister. I'm fine. Please, just go. Casey purses his lips. Finally, he nods as he begins to make his way down the bridge. I note his car far from sight. As I raise my hands above my head and focus on my breathing. He turns, finally, to face me one last time. I hope to see you again, Sasha. There's something really special about you. I watch him leave until his car pulls off the corner and drives into the night. I whip my cell phone out of my pocket, my heart rate finally slowing. I find my speed dial and press the phone to my ears as I make my way back into the car. Sasha? Anya's voice is concerned and jittery. I'm worried. What's going on? I steady my voice as I put the car into drive. Anya. I'm going to be late. There's something I have to see to. Now. Wait, what? Sash, it's nearly midnight. What on earth could you possibly... Click. The car roars to life as I shove my key to the ignition. Amy starts singing as I adjust my mirror. I'm never being a fucking hero again. Starting right after I avenge that redhead.